Welcome to part three of Indians, Jacks, and Pines by Stuart D. Gross, published in 1962. Tonight we are going to look at several more chapters, and beginning with chapter seven titled Pioneer Farming. One for the blackbird, one for the crow, one for the cutworm, and three to grow. Today the Saginaw Valley is one of the richest farm areas in the nation. It is known as the bean pot of the world because most of the navy beans eaten in the United States are grown in its rich soil. But it wasn't always so. In Saginaw's early days, the little jingle quoted above was the discouraging plant, plaint the farmers used to describe their troubles. Most of the early farmers came from east, the eastern United States where soil conditions were different than found here. At first, they tried to apply eastern farming methods to the Saginaw area. These failed. It took a lot more than a plow and harrow to prepare this soil, and when a crop did appear, uh, there were the birds. Albert Miller began farming on his little clearing at Greenpoint in 1833. He planted his first crop on March 27, and it came up very well. Through years of, uh, through early spring and summer, it gave promise of yielding enough corn to eat, and in addition, some to sell. Just as the corn was ready to pick, Miller said, clouds of blackbirds came from the marshes and in spite of all our efforts destroyed the entire crop. From 30 acres of corn, which would have given 50 to 60 bushels of corn, uh, to the acre we saved only the butts of the ears the birds could not reach. To fight off the blackbirds, the farmers built scaffolds and in the fields and children sat up there to yell at the birds when they appeared. Ephraim S. Williams and his brother B. O. Williams at one time shot into a mass of birds swirling over the cornfield. Boys picked up the dead ones, a total of 545. Some farmers grew wheat, <clears throat> but there was no mill in Saginaw to, to grind the grain into flour. The wheat had to be taken to Flushing near Flint. If this mill couldn't handle the wheat, the farmer had to go on to Pontiac. It could be a 10-day trip to mill and back. The Saginaw pioneer farmer ate wild game, pork, bread, and potatoes, plus whatever vegetables he could raise. In addition to raising crops, he kept busy piling and burning trees and brush and uprooting stumps. Next to his plow, the most important implement he owned were his gun and axe. There were more sheep than any other type of livestock. Some hogs were kept to discourage the rattlesnakes. Almost every farm had a cow. Oxen were used to, uh, for farm work because they were cheaper to feed than horses and also could be eaten if the going was too bad. The farms were far apart, and the social life revolved around barn raisings, corn huskings, and other bees that drew families together. Land was cheap, only $1.25 an acre, but it was hard to clear. After the trees had been cut, the farmer had to pull the stumps and roots. The pioneer plow was a big thing made with a large white oak beam. If it was made properly by the blacksmith, it could cut through four or five inches of solid oak root. The log houses the, the pioneers built had wall-to-wall -wall dirt floors. Living was centered around a large open fireplace with its iron crane and pot hooks for cooking. Light came from a pan of grease or with, with uh, a coiled rag as a wick. Standard household articles were the butter churn, spinning wheel, yarn winder, wash tubs, and refuse buckets. Rattlesnakes were plentiful. Farmers at work wore heavy boots that came high up on the leg. One farmer set out to move a pile of branches. As he pulled one branch out, he uncovered a rattlesnake. More branches were pulled and more rattlesnakes slithered to, um, to the ground. The entire pile seemed to, fill, to be filled with snakes. The farmer walked away, moving the pile um, could wait until the snakes finally moved out. Chapter 8, Saginaw County is Formed. There is nothing very romantic about the formation of a county or a township. Unlike cities which were built by men, counties and townships are formed by some higher government by decree. But Saginaw County wasn't always its present size. On sep September 10, 1822, General Lewis Cass, by proclamation, declared that the county of Saginaw shall be attached to and composed of part of the county of Oakland. In 1830, the territorial government of Michigan passed a law which formed a new <coughs> county of Saginaw, and its boundaries stretched to the Straits of Mackinac. In 1831, another law was given 
or was passed giving Saginaw County 32 townships, and the boundaries under this law included portions of the present-day Gladwin, Midland, and Tuscola counties. Saginaw was the county seat. Although Michigan was not admitted to the Union until 1837, it had adopted state government in 1835 when the first state constitution was ratified and state officers were elected. It was the 1835 state government that passed a law creating a new Saginaw County of pieces of what today helps make up Bay County. The rest of the former Saginaw County was cut away to make other counties. These 1835 boundary lines stood until February 17, 1857, when the state legislator, le legislature created Bay County from parts of Saginaw, Aranac, and Midland counties, provided it was approved by the electors of those counties. Saginaw and Midland residents voted against this plan, but Bay County residents took the matter to court, and the ruling was that the votes of persons living within the boundary lines of the proposed Bay County should count more than those outside. Bay County was formed as a unit of government in 1858. Saginaw County thus was trimmed down to the boundary lines it owns today. Meanwhile, townships had been organizing within the county. Saginaw Township was the first to organize. It, was the, it, it had its first meeting on April 4, 1831. Marion Township was the last it organized in 1880. There are 27 townships in Saginaw County and each elects a supervisor. The county is governed by a board of supervisors, which meets regularly throughout the year and passes laws for the county much after the fashion of the legislature or a city council. <clears throat> Chapter 9. The City is Born. In 1822, the year Fort Saginaw was built, two men, Dr. Charles Little and his son Norman, came from New York and made their way through the forest to Saginaw. Both were dreamers, and what uh, they saw pleased them well. They could see a city where only pine trees grew, and their name was forever to be associated with Saginaw. Dr. Little brought, um, bought many acres of land on both sides of the Saginaw River. Then he and his son went back to New York. That same year, two other men came to Fort Saginaw. One was Captain James Farley, the other was James McCloskey. They, these men were dreamers, too. They surveyed and purchased from the government 136 acres of land. This was to become the center of what is now the west side of Saginaw. Later, McCloskey sold his holdings to Dr. Little. Fairly kept his. The government sold the fort and its property in 1825 to Samuel W. Dexter of Washtenaw County. In 1830, Dexter had his holdings surveyed and platted and gave it the name of Saginaw City. It was, uh, it was a name only. It does not appear that Farley, McCloskey, or Dexter ever were residents of Saginaw. They purchased land for speculation or development and sold later at a profit. Making a profit on frontier land was not difficult. The entire nation was seized with the idea that the West was going to grow rapidly and land in the wilderness began to sell faster and faster. As it sold, prices went up, and prices, as prices went up, more men were infected by the, the get-rich fever. Men in New York, who never went further west than the Hudson River, <coughs> would map out um, towns in the wilderness and then, sell lar large, and then sell lots to eager Easterners who wanted to move west. It was one of the maddest periods in early American life. <clears throat> in 1835, Dexter sold his land in Saginaw to Dr. Millington of Ypsilanti for $11,000. And the next year, Norman Little returned to Saginaw, determined to build the city his father had dreamed about. He had financial backing from the firm of Mackey, Oakley, and Jenison of New York. Norman Little was a promoter, one of the best. Before he returned to Saginaw, he flooded the East with advertisements about the charms of Saginaw. Prospective settlers were told they couldn't find a better place to live, that within a few years there would be a deep water canal connecting Saginaw with Lake Michigan. This canal, the handbills shouted, was to make Saginaw the leading port city of all the Great Lakes. Little arrived in 1836 in grand style. He came overland to Detroit, and there he chartered the steamboat Gover Governor Marcy, this he loaded with important Detroit businessmen and, and some settlers. The steamboat arrived here in July and caused a lot of excitement. It was the first steamboat to be seen on the Saginaw River. Little set out to build his city by buying up the uh, lands his father had failed to buy earlier. 
Dr. Millington, who in 1835 had purchased all of Dexter's holdings, calmly asked Little $55,000 for his properties, and he got it. Little had a new map made up of the city. This one included 407 blocks, and on paper it looked fine. By the end of 1837, Saginaw City had 900 residents. Meanwhile, Little and his backers decided the new city needed a hotel. The Webster Hotel, on the corner of what is now Michigan and Cleveland, was built. It was big enough to meet the hotel needs of a town of 10,000. And for a long time, it was the grandest hotel in all of Michigan, and the emptiest. Inflation hit its peak in 1838. What happened in Saginaw was happening all over the nation. Land prices zoomed. One 80 acre plot within a mile of Saginaw River sold for $80,000. More than a mile stretch of land to the south of Fort Saginaw was mapped out. Buyers, however, were not told the land was covered with water. The year round and heavily populated with frogs, muskrats, and swamp weeds. Buildings went up in Saginaw City in this period. Stores appeared, warehouses were built, banks opened and issued their own money. Paper bills were promises to pay in silver, and had, which was printed on them. The money was not backed by the U.S. government and was as good only as the bank that issued it. Even Zawaki, which was little more than a fur trading post, had a bank that issued money. One of the Zilwaukee Bank's notes was a $3 bill, one of the several banks that issued such bills during this period. The panic came in 1838. The good times faded. The people realized with a sickening feeling that the bills that they had accepted in payment for goods or had received as wages were now worthless. Depression had come to the United States and it set the development of Saginaw back by many, many years. For a long time, the business of the nation was paralyzed as a result of the wild speculation. Saginaw City changed from a bustling center of trade to a farming village. Those who stayed did so because they had no money and no place to go. Those who had places to go left. On April 9, 1841, Little and his associates sold out all of their holdings on both sides of the river for $200,000. This was a mere fraction of the sum of money um, they had poured out in their efforts to build a city. Little went back east. <clears throat> in um, chapter 10, we will read about the Grand Canal that was mentioned a moment ago. Sometime in 1836, this advertisement appeared in Eastern newspapers. The city of Saginaw lies in the heart of Michigan at the head of a of steamboat navigation on the Saginaw River, which is formed by the Flint, Cass, Shiawassee, and Titabawassee Rivers. The Shiawassee may easily be, um, doubtless soon will be connected by a short canal with the Grand River, by which trade um, of all the, that country and much from the eastern shore of Lake Michigan will center at Saginaw. The idea was to build a big ship canal across the middle of Michigan, following the right carved out by the glacial spillway. It would follow uh, the course of the Bad River to Maple River, then the Grand to the Grand River, which empties into Lake Michigan. This would permit ships to sail from Chicago to Saginaw and Detroit by way of Saginaw Bay, a much shorter voyage than by way of the Straits of Mackinac. <clears throat> The scheme was approved by the state of Michigan. The first legislature wanted to do something to make the state attractive to settlers, and the Saginaw Grand Canal was one of the public improvement projects they approved. Norman Little helped push the idea. Early in 1837, surveys were made and specifications prepared for the first section of the canal, which would run west from Bad River. Uh, Little was given one of the contracts for grubbing and clearing the route. A crew of 100 Irish immigrants was hired and the work began. Getting supplies to the men was a tough job. It was just as tough as digging the canal. The trail to the construction site, about 25 miles west of Saginaw, was through the same heavy forest that the canal was to run. Many trees were cut by the crew and dams were built. The canal, as planned, was to be, the, was to be 20 miles long, 90 feet wide, and 9 feet deep in this particular section. The work continued until July 1838 when it suddenly stopped. The panic had hit and the state no longer could make payments for the canal jobs because the Morris Canal and Banking Company, which had promised to loan the state $5 million for the project, 
had failed. The Irish workmen didn't get paid and lost their Irish tempers, too. They came to Saginaw for three days paraded down the streets threatening all they thought had anything to do with the canal. But once the Irishmen realized they weren't going to get paid because there was no money, they left to find jobs elsewhere. In the less than two years of work on the canal, the state spent $22,256. Ten years later, in 1849, the state approved incorporation of a company composed of Gardner D. Williams, James D. Frazier, and D. J. Johnson of Saginaw to complete the canal. The company was known as the Saginaw Grand River Canal Company. It put $200,000 worth of stock on the market to raise the money to finance the project. The stock didn't sell and the company failed. So too died the dreams of a ship canal across Michigan. Remains of this canal still are visible. Travelers from St. Charles to Brant in Saginaw County will notice on their left, just crossing the south branch of the Bad River, a straight stretch of stream about two or three quarters of a mile long. This is all that remains of the work of the 100 Irishmen. And in uh, installment four, we will uh, begin looking at the city of the swamp, which is what Saginaw was known as, as because it was primarily swamp at the time. So hope you'll join us again then.